Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dharmasar Tero, and I'm here with the 24th episode of our ongoing series on Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. This is kind of an afterword or afterthought to the previous part one series of 24 videos, including the introduction. And where we will go in the future with this series. Now, you remember the last time we were talking about the axiom of Nibbana. Nibbana is an undefined, indefinable, inexplicable term denoting a state beyond being and non-being. Some people may question whether this is even possible, but the Buddha tells us that he experienced it, and lots of people who followed his instructions confirmed that. So we're going to take that as our basic assumption, that there is something or a, some state <laughs> or some experience of Nibbana. And we went through many terms that talk around Nibbana without actually explaining what it is. And that can only be experienced for oneself because the experience is quite inexplicable. So we're going to make that our primary assumption. An axiom is something you remember that's assumed to be true. And we also mentioned that because of the necessity of having to talk around Nibbana, because we can't discuss it directly, the Buddha's teaching is also apophatic. In other words, the Buddha often talks about Nibbana without mentioning it directly. And certainly everything in the Buddha's teaching is related to Nibbana. So Nibbana is the root axiom, the primary axiom of the Buddha's teaching. Not only that, but the Buddha's teaching is fractal because every single sutta, whether it explicitly mentions Nibbana or not, is actually about attaining Nibbana. Why is that? Because Nibbana is the cessation of all suffering. And actually everything that everybody does is connected with reducing or eliminating suffering. So we have to say that the cessation of suffering is actually the greatest human endeavor and the highest goal. So more than that, the suttas are ontologically coherent. In other words, every sutta references a core of ontological roots. And if you don't understand ontology, this would be a good time to go look it up, especially someplace like Wikipedia that has a good explanation of what ontology is. I discovered ontology back in 2003 because I was trying to make sense of a very esoteric hidden teaching in the Vedas. And so ordinary logical tools weren't powerful enough. I needed something that was equally as conceptually powerful as the Vedanta itself so that I could analyze and dissect and deconstruct it. So I discovered ontology by serendipitous methods because I was doing also some web consulting and in those days web 2.0 was a big deal. Ontology and languages like OWL and RDF were very very important and they still are in some ways but now the tools have advanced even beyond that. So what I'm suggesting is that we can analyze the Buddha's teaching ontologically. Hasn't that already been done? Yes. The Abhidhamma is an analysis, an ontological analysis of the Buddha's teaching. The only problem is Abhidhamma uses the definitions that were introduced by the commentaries. They don't use the original definitions of the terms in the suttas. So they ignore the Buddha's own definitions and explanations of his terminology, 
and they come up with some others speculated from word roots. Now this is a foreign methodology imported from the Vedanta schools of South India, especially Shankaracharya, where he didn't like what the Vedanta was saying. So he went back to the word roots and used alternate definitions to speculate new meanings for the terms in the Vedanta. Well, it's kind of a neat trick, but I don't think it says a lot for his integrity, unfortunately. So we want to go back to the original explanations and definitions of the terminology in the suttas that are found in the suttas themselves and do an ontological analysis of the Buddhist teaching based on that. I've done this informally, and what I've come up with as a result is that the Buddhist teaching is ontologically coherent. In other words, none of the suttas violate the ontology given in any of the others. So this is a wonderful thing. This is an amazing quality. Not even modern science has that. So all the suttas point to the same indefinable, ecstatic, wonderful state called Nibbana. Actually, it has many names, but Nibbana is the principal one because it references back to the fire simile, and we discussed that in previous episodes of this series. So the Buddha's teaching is apophatic, fractal, and ontologically coherent. And no other tradition or system of thought, including modern science, can make this claim. So the Buddha's teaching is quite wonderful. And the root ontology, or the major categories of the Buddha's teaching, into which all the suttas fit, is the Four Noble Truths. And here they are, the truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path to the cessation of suffering. The Buddha tells us that suffering is to be comprehended. The origin of suffering is to be abandoned. The cessation of suffering is to be experienced, and the path to the cessation of suffering is to be developed. And this is, of course, the Noble Eightfold Path. So if we do that, we find that the teaching of Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, is actually the core or the root engine of the Buddha's teaching. On one side we see descending the progression of states from ignorance through suffering. And this is the first and second noble truth, which is sometimes called the flood. On the right we see the green bars rising, and they're going from conviction to unbinding. And these are the third and fourth noble truths, the raft. Now what's interesting about this is that the same process of becoming is used both on the left side and the right side. The difference is the process of becoming on the left in red leads to suffering and then starting a new cycle of becoming beginning with ignorance. Whereas the cycle of becoming on the right, in green, leads to the cessation of becoming, the attainment of Nibbana, and complete unbinding from samsara. This is the Buddha's teaching. So when I discovered ontology back in 2003, another thing that I discovered around the same time was that we are headed towards a tremendous wave of change, an unstoppable wave built on technological advancement, and that this technological advancement was increasing at an exponential rate. Now, I don't know about the so-called singularity, uh, when computers become more intelligent than people. Right now, we're having trouble just teaching them to drive. <laughs> So it might be a while before we get to that point. Or they may become more intelligent than humans in very narrow specialized areas or something like that. But there's no denying that a wave of change, a wave of innovation is taking over the world and sweeping away 
many of our previous institutions and organizations and structures in society. And this is very unsettling to some people. We find in particular that Buddhism, I put the word Buddhism in quotes, because really there is the teaching of the Buddha, and then there are various uh, sectarian religious organizations built on that teaching or on derivatives of that teaching, which actually don't match up very well with the original teaching itself. These organizations are hierarchical in nature. They are conservative and static. And their main ambition is to protect themselves from change. And what's happening is, without any exception as far as I can see, is that they are becoming more and more irrelevant as the society changes around them. So they're trying to keep things the same. They're trying to keep their hierarchical structures. They're trying to keep their traditions and their positions and so on. And what's the result? They're losing their popularity. Young people are going on and living in an entirely different way that has nothing to do with the old ways and that in most cases actually contradict the old ways. So what can we do about this? What can we do to refresh the appeal of Buddhism or Buddha's teaching rather <laughs> to a new generation that has no respect for tradition, authority, hierarchy, position, and indeed embraces change much, much quicker and much, much easier than any generation up to now. Well, we can look at it like it's a problem. Oh, these young people today just don't understand the old ways, the good traditions that brought us to this point. So they're condemned and sinful and nasty. And we can resist it. And as far as I can see, that attitude will lead to the complete disenfranchisement of Buddhism as a viable spiritual path. We're already quite a ways down that road. So is there another solution? Well, yeah, there is. We can look at this wave of change as an opportunity to make Buddhism more relevant to the everyday life of people, to make the Buddhist teaching a fresh, lively source of inspiration for everyone. And how can we do that? Well, I have some ideas. <laughs> Let's assume that Buddha reached Nibbana and delivered the suttas over 2,600 years ago. Let's assume that's true. Then he gave an implementation in other words, a practical aspect of his teaching called the Sangha, based on the social and psychological conditions at the time. Now, the problem is that today, those implementations, including religious Buddhism of every variety, are certainly obsolete. Because things have changed so much, they've become practically unworkable. And the organizations based on them are static, hierarchical, and authoritarian. They're resisting change. But the change that's happening now is so pervasive and inevitable. I think that means the end of those institutions. So, we need to hack the Dhamma and create many new implementations. And instead of working but to maintain these obsolete implementations, we want to be free to pursue maximum interestingness, maximum attractiveness, maximum coolness, so that people today will want to participate. Now, how do we do this? Well, first of all, we have to get rid of the idea that change is bad. Change is not bad. Inappropriate change is bad. And we have to be able to separate the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha's breakthrough, the Buddha's discovery, 
from its implementation in society. In other words, we need to be able to abstract the Dhamma from the Sangha and take a look at where the Sangha measures up to the challenges of today and be honest where it doesn't. And those areas are the parts of the implementation that are obsolete and need to be changed. There's a difference in the attitude of a conservative person who resists change and a progressive, forward-thinking person who seeks it out. So when Prometheus in Greek mythology took the fire from the abode of the gods and gave it to mankind, he was condemned by Zeus. Why? Because he was changing the status quo. He was giving powerful tools to ordinary people for their benefit and diminishing the advantage of the advanced knowledge of the gods. So he got in some trouble. But we have a lot of people who are similar in attitude today. They want to take the tools developed by industrial enterprise and nations like computers and software and the internet and democratize the power of these tools and make them available to everybody. Let's call these people Prometheans. Okay? I'm using the terminology from Venkatesh Rao in case you're wondering where it comes from. I'll give the links later. So Rao says, Prometheans who discover high leverage unexpected possibilities enter a zone of serendipity. The universe seems to conspire to magnify their agency to superhuman levels. But pastoralists, conservatives who reject change altogether as profanity, turn lack of agency into a self-fulfilling prophecy and enter a zone of zemblanity. The universe seems to conspire to diminish whatever agency they do have resulting in the perception that technology diminishes agency. So let me decode this <laughs> saying. This is a deep saying. You have to think about it. In other words, a person who takes, let's say, a programming language or the internet or any of the commonly available technologies today and uses it to enhance his understanding and empower himself to do something that he couldn't do before is a Promethean. He's taking these tools developed by the corporate and government interests and democratizing them and spreading their benefit over a large number of people. This creates tremendous value, much more than the value created by conservative approach such as banking, where they get to loan out 10 times the amount of their deposits at interest. <laughs> so. The universe seems to support this endeavor. Why? Because of the power of serendipity, the power of so-called chance or coincidence supporting. But people who try to stop change, who consider change the enemy, are actually cutting off their own support because by rejecting change, then they are overlooking opportunities to make the kind of things they're trying to do easier, faster, cheaper, and so on. So this is actually quite a detailed discussion that we're going to get into in our new series on hacking the Dhamma. This is just a very, very quick introduction. And it's going to be based on everything that we've done up to this time. So <laughs> the Bana series is still very valid and important for this. The universe seems to diminish the opportunities available to people who want to fight change because they're not open to the serendipity, the synchronicity of things that just happen to come up opportunistically. They've got a plan and they're going to stick with it no matter what. So they lose the opportunities that come up in everyday life. So now, how would we apply this to the Buddha's teaching? Well, here's my suggestion. Let's assume that the Buddha's teaching in the suttas is correct. 
Now, we're not going to say anything about the derivative works like the Abhidhamma and the commentaries and Visuddhimagga and so many others, because those are already representative of a collusion between the scholar priests and government agencies for political purposes. So we're going to ignore those for now and just start with the original suttas spoken by the Buddha himself. Let's test this assumption by self-observation. In other words, let's try the experiments or the methods given by the Buddha and observe for ourselves whether we can verify them or not. So then we collect the verifiable techniques. We collect the techniques that work and we investigate the synergies between them. What happens if we combine several workable techniques? Does it enhance their power? Does it improve their functionality? My experience says it does. So then we create a new implementation of the Buddha's teaching based on that experience. We take the experience that has worked for us with the Buddha's teaching and we use it to create a new type of Sangha, a new type of implementation that actually matches our experience today. Then we share this implementation as a non-hierarchical open source project. For example, all of our series on video on YouTube are open source. They use a Creative Commons copyright and everyone is free to share them as long as they give an attribution. So this is the philosophy, this is the mood of open source that makes powerful solutions available to everyone freely to mix and match and use in their own projects. Now why is this superior to the old sectarian religious model? Well, I'm going to quote Venkatesh Rao again. The difference between the two is simple. The geographic world solves problems in goal-driven ways through literal or metaphoric zero-sum territorial conflict. The networked world solves them in serendipitous ways through innovations that break assumptions about how resources can be used, typically making them less rivalrous and unexpectedly abundant. So what does this mean? That means if we just keep to ourselves our little group, our little school, our little monastery or our little organizations and whatever, then <laughs> we actually are creating a territory. We're saying this is our turf. Anybody that comes in our turf has to accept our rules, has to do things our way. And if you try to change anything, that's a disturbance and we're going to kick you out. Whereas the networked personality operates in a completely different way. He says, well, there are some good ideas in that old Visuddhi Magga. And by golly, there's some good ideas in the Mahayana as well. And you know, those Zen guys came up with some pretty cool sayings too. Well, maybe we can integrate these in some way that's ontologically consistent and use them to enhance our progress in meditation and attain the goal. So let me give some examples. We've all seen online Dhamma talks, distributing realized wisdom globally via the internet media. So this is already happening. A lot of people are doing this. What's so great about that? Well, in the past, Buddhism was restricted to certain geographic territories certain kingdoms, certain empires, certain countries, and so on. And if you were living in that country, you were expected to become a Buddhist, or at least there was a lot of pressure to become a Buddhist. And if you go outside that country, it's very difficult to be a Buddhist because there were no lines of communication to any Buddhist societies, teachers, sanghas, and so on. So now with the internet, that's all changed. Anybody can sit down with a smartphone, video themselves giving a Dhamma talk, and within a few minutes, it's instantly available all over the world. 
So this is a huge breakthrough, and it has the effect of making all the teachings from all the lineages available everywhere. This is a wonderful thing. It creates abundance. It promotes serendipity. It feeds synergy among different practices and teachings and makes them all much more powerful. Another example would be our own work, the Dharmasar Solution, which is a new original implementation of the Buddha's teaching. You can go look at the site and check it out for yourself. I'm not going to describe it here and blow my own horn. <laughs> Let's take another speculative project, Neo Abhidhamma. Traditional Abhidhamma is an ontological analysis of the Buddha's teaching according to the definitions in the commentaries. But Neo Abhidhamma would be an ontological analysis of the original suttas with powerful software tools such as Protege and OWL and RDF. And these will lead to for example, an online ontology that can be queried by a user. In other words, you could actually ask the suttas questions and get meaningful answers in natural language. This is a software development project I've wanted to do for a long time. Uh, but the skill, I don't have the skills. <laughs> I don't have the resources right now to do it. But it sure would be fun, and I'm sure it would be very valuable for a lot of people. Here's another one. Dharma Collectives. Hacking teams experimenting with new alternate implementations of the Buddhist teaching. Now these could be uh, online or in real life or some combination of the two. Uh, I've noticed in my teaching work a lot of isolated students of the Buddhist teaching all over the world. I would love to bring these people together in a network that would facilitate their learning and practice of the Buddhist teaching. This is something that has to be developed and the team that gets this one together is going to become very very successful globally. So are these projects going to work? We don't know. There's no way to find out except to try them. So it sounds like you're just tinkering around with the Buddha's teaching and that's you know Verboten. <laughs> well, let me quote Rao one more time. Tinkering is a process of serendipity seeking that does not just tolerate uncertainty and ambiguity, it requires it. When conditions for it are right, the result is a snowballing effect where pleasant surprises lead to more pleasant surprises. What makes this a problem solving mechanism? is diversity of individual perspectives coupled with the law of large numbers, the statistical idea that rare events can become highly probable if there are enough trials going on. If an increasing number of highly diverse individuals operate this way, the chances of any given problem getting solved via a serendipitous new idea slowly rises. This is the luck of networks. So by forming a global network based on the Buddha's teaching that allows and encourages experimentation and developing new applications, new implementations of the Buddha's teaching, the chances that somebody is going to get it right and develop a new way of practicing the Buddha's teaching that gives access to many, many more people are increasing with every new person added to the network. This is the law of networks, well-known network effect, that a network becomes more valuable with the square of its links, with the square of its nodes. So I'm going to leave these threads open and take them up in the next series, which is going to be called Hacking the Dhamma. Thank you very much. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukitatta Bhavantu Sukitatta